Welcome to the final installment of the OSS Society's OSO Social Conversation Series. I'm Charles Pink, president of the OSS Society, and on its behalf, thank you for making this inaugural series such a huge success. Over 900 people have registered for tonight's discussion. The series has received such an enthusiastic response, we're already thinking about planning the next one. The inspiration for the name of this month-long series was drawn from the fact that so many OSS personnel were members of the social register, it was said its initials really stood for oh so social. And for this reason, we're asking you not to practice social distancing tonight. Instead, we'd like everyone gathered tonight to practice what the OSS Society likes to call oh so social distancing. Because we could not hold the Donovan Award dinner this year, we wanted to use this virtual format to keep our OSS family together. And we're honored to bring together leading figures from the intelligence and special operations communities to discuss critical national security issues. We're very fortunate to tonight to have the most respected leaders from the intelligence and special operations communities joining us this evening. Dr. Michael Vickers, Secretary Robert Gates, Secretary Leon Panetta, General David Petraeus, and Admiral William McCraven. And I'd like to thank our series sponsor, Pfizer, the sponsor of tonight's event, Khaki International, Clark Construction, Delta Bridge, Palantir Technologies, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and the Star Foundation and our oh so social patrons for their generous support. And I'd also like to thank our media sponsor, The Cypher Brief. And to the hundreds of people who are with us tonight, including members of the intelligence and special operations communities, the military service academies, representatives from the intelligence and armed services committees, and senior government officials, thank you for supporting the OSS Society and for your service. Before this evening's discussion begins, I'd like to spend a few minutes showing you the OSS Society's most ambitious project, building the National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations. Eventually, educational programs such as tonight's will be held in the museum's Oh So Social Club, a bar that will serve as gathering place for the special operations and intelligence communities, because as a special operator once told me, every operation starts or ends in a bar. I'd like to show you a brief video about the museum and we'd welcome your support in making this vision a reality. I used to look at the pictures of the people in the OSS, the guys that were in Detachment 101, or that were the Jed Bergs, were the people that were the foundation of the OSS, our history. And I always used to look at the faces and I looked at the eyes. And what dawned on me was, there's no difference between those people that were doing that as the greatest generation and the people that are doing it now. There's the same commitment, there's the same belief in country, there's the same love of what this nation stands for. Basically look at somebody and say, you need somebody to go? Send me. I'm your person. The glorious amateurs from World War II's Office of Strategic Services have become today's quiet professionals of the U.S. intelligence and special operations communities. The National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations will honor Americans who have served as our nation's first line of defense. It will educate the public about the importance of intelligence and special operations to the preservation of freedom. And inspire future generations to serve. It will be a museum unlike any other immersing visitors in what it takes to answer our nation's call. We have a unique opportunity to pay tribute to the silent warriors who fight in the shadows for us. By the very nature of their work, these silent warriors of the intelligence and special operations communities do their job out of public view. Their actions are vital to protecting our national security. The National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations will tell their story of sacrifice and dedication and bravery. I ask you to join me in supporting this important effort. America needs this museum. The spearhead points the way forward in the past, the present, and the future. 
Find out how you can help make this museum a reality and honor those who keep us safe. I'm honored to introduce noted author and cocktail historian, Philip Green. If you've attended the Donovan Award dinner in years past, you'll recognize Phil as the OSS Society's bartender, where he's presented the evening's cocktails from behind our replica of the bar from the Hotel Ritz in Paris that Ernest Hemingway and Colonel David Bruce liberated in 1944. We could not ask for a better or a better red bartender. Phil's the author of To Have and Have Another, a Hemingway cocktail companion, A Drinkable Feast, a cocktail companion to 1920s Paris, and the Manhattan, the story of the first modern cocktail. When he's not writing books about cocktail, Phil is the trademark counsel for the United States Marine Corps. And tonight we're pleased to have him offer a special drink that he created to honor the 75th anniversary of the OSS's creation in 2017, the OSS 75. Thank you, Charles. Uh, as always, it's a great honor to, to be doing this uh, for the OSS Society and uh, uh, I, I hope the, the last drink we're doing will be especially special. So uh, thank you again. So let me take you back to the spring and summer of 1941. World War II was almost two years old, uh, but the US was not yet in the war. Roosevelt and Churchill knew that the United States entry into the war was inevitable. And Churchill was encouraging Roosevelt to, to up our game when it came to intelligence gathering, uh, which we of course needed to do. Uh, in, in the mindset of a lot of American uh, officials back in those days was, was sort of personified by the, the, the historic words of uh, then Secretary of State Henry Stimson in 1929, who decided he didn't want to engage in crypto analysis or, uh, you know, um, intercepting diplomatic cables because a gentleman doesn't read another man's mail. Well, if we'd been less gentlemanly, maybe we would have known earlier about Pearl Harbor, but that's a discussion for another day. So uh, Churchill sends his top uh, spy master over to New York, a fellow named William Stevenson. I'm, of course, you're very familiar with him. He was leading an organization called British Security Coordination in Rockefeller Center. Um, and in May of 1941, he sent two of his top lieutenants from British Naval Intelligence, the Naval Intelligence Division, Admiral John Godfrey and his um, special assistant, Ian Fleming, you might recognize that name. So they came to, uh, to New York to meet with Stevenson and also to meet with, with uh, General Donovan. Now, Ian Fleming, in addition to writing Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and in, in addition to creating and writing a number of James Bond novels, he had a fascinating career in, in naval intelligence himself. He, he authored or is believed to have co-authored on something called the Trout Memo, which uh, was a, a shared with all British intelligence. It had the idea of we need to trick the Germans the way a fisherman uh, deceives a trout to, to rise to the bait. He was um, the mastermind behind something called Operation Mincemeat, which was a brilliant deception campaign where they used a dead body dressed up as a British officer. They created a whole identity for him. He washes ashore in Spain carrying uh, handcuffed to his wrist, a briefcase full of phony secret papers that suggested that we weren't gonna invade Sicily after conquering North Africa. The allies were gonna hit either Sardinia or Greece. So the Germans weren't prepared for the invasion of Sicily that followed. Um, so uh, Ian Fleming also created something called the 30 Assault Unit, which was uh, brilliant in its day. It was a commando team that would accompany a military strike but go straight for the intelligence sources, uh, you know, to capture secret plans for submarines or V1 bases or V2 bases or things like that. So Fleming had a fascinating career in intelligence. So after meeting with Donovan, with Stevenson, Fleming comes to Washington, D.C. and moves in with Donovan, spending time at his home at, uh, on, on 2920 R Street here in Georgetown. Uh, later was the home of Catherine Graham the um, owner of the Washington Post. And he hunkered down for a number of days in the British Embassy, uh, according to his friend Ivor Bryce, who was in the, the OSS. Um, Fleming had been whisked off to a room in the new annex of the embassy, locked in with a pen and paper in the set necessities of life, and had written under armed guard 
around the clock, a document of some 70 pages covering every aspect of a giant in secret intelligence service and secret operational organization. To thank him, Donovan later gave Ian Fleming a special police 38 revolver inscribed for special services. So um, um, Fleming and Stevenson uh, hit it off immediately. And, and um, Fleming wrote later that uh, Bill Stevenson made the, the, the strongest martinis east of the Rocky Mountains. So you have this love of martinis that he shared with Stevenson that you find, of course, in the James Bond novels. Um, so the drink I'm doing tonight has a component of Ian Fleming in it. If you've read the, the, the novel Casino Royale or seen the film, you're familiar with the Vesper cocktail. And the Vesper cocktail appears in Casino Royale. Um, there's a scene where he's having a drink with CIA agent Felix Leiter, and he orders a martini. So it's a dry martini, one in a deep champagne goblet. And the waiter says, oui, monsieur. Oh, just a moment. Three measures of Gordon's gin, one of vodka, half a measure of quinoa lele. Shake it very well until it's ice cold, then add a large thin slice of lemon peel. Got it? Ah, certainly, monsieur. The barman seemed pleased with the idea. Gosh, that's certainly a drink, says Leiter. Bond laughed. When I'm uh, uh, concentrating, I never have more than one drink before dinner, but I do like that drink to be large and very cold and very well made. I, I hate small portions of anything, particularly when they taste bad. This drink's my own invention. I'm going to patent it when I think of a good name. Actually, it's trademark, but why quibble? Fleming ended up naming uh, the drink the Vesper in Casino Royale after the love interest Vesper Lind, who turned out to be a double agent. Um, in the, in the novel, Bond explains the drink he's invented. He asks Vesper her permission to name the drink after her. And she, he says, it sounds perfect. The, the Vesper sounds perfect. It's very appropriate to the violet hour when my cocktail will now be drunk all over the world. And she's, of course, very flattered. And she replies, so long as I can try one first. It sounds a drink to be proud of. Well, Fleming was proud of it uh, for a while. And then he admitted a few years later in the Manchester Guardian newspaper that he sampled the drink some years after Casino Royale was published, and he found it to be unpalatable. Um, so the term Vesper actually comes from the term, uh, the, best, the word Vesper means evening prayers. And one of Fleming's neighbors in Jamaica was an old English couple, and every evening they would have happy hour, and the butler would say, Vespers are served, sir. So um, tonight's drink contains the Vesper, but we also wanted to uh, model it off of a famous drink, the French 75, named after the French artillery piece, but also the, the champagne cocktail. And the champagne cocktail is a very simple drink. You just take a glass of champagne, you get a sugar cube, and you drench the sugar cube with Angostura bitters, and you drop the sugar cube into the glass, and it, it, it bubbles and it creates a great show. That's all the champagne cocktail is. But what we're doing tonight is something a little different. We're gonna start with that glass of champagne, but I'm going to also make a Vesper. So let's go with the three ounces of Gordon's gin. Now, when I made this drink three years ago, uh, we had to tr we had to infuse 500 sugar cubes with with Vesper cocktail. And this spray bottle was filled with Vesper, and I had cookie sheets covered with um, with sugar cubes, and we ended up coating every one of those sugar cubes with Vesper cocktail. So now the, the Lille, three quarters ounce of that. James Bond said you have to drink it until it's very cold, which I do, of course. And there you have the Vesper. Now we just gotta get that sugar cube. Here's your lemon peel. And Charles, I love your quotes about uh, every operation begins and ends in a bar. 
and the, the bar that you're going to design, you need a new slogan like you can't spell ossified without OSS, right? So here we go. Let's pretend this is a Jedburg uh, Special Operations Commando dropping into uh, dropping into the drink. I guess I waited too long. So um, I get to the OSS 75 based on the champagne cocktail, but having a Vesper infused sugar cube in there. Here's to the tip of the spear. Let's tip our glasses to the tip of the spear. Cheers, everyone. Uh, stay well and vote early and often. Cheers. Thank you, Phil. And uh, I'd like to repeat what General Mattis said to Phil after watching his uh, presentation at last year's Donovan Award dinner. Thank you for glamorizing alcohol. It's now my honor to welcome Dr. Michael Vickers, who will be our moderator this evening. Dr. Vickers' career as a special operator, CIA operations officer, national security policymaker, and intelligence community leader has spanned the last two decades of the Cold War through a decade and a half of our war with Al-Qaeda and its offshoots and allies, service that saw unprecedented senior tenure across Republican and Democratic administrations. Most recently, Dr. Vickers served as the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, exercising authority, direction, and control over the National Security Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the National Reconnaissance Office, the Defense Security Service, and the intelligence components of the military services and combatant commands. He's received the nation's highest awards in the fields of intelligence and defense, including the Presidential National Security Medal and the OSS Society's William J. Donovan Award. Dr. Vickers has written a memoir that will be published by Knopf Penguin Random House in early 2021. He currently serves as an executive vice president at InQtel, a principal with the Telemus Group, a senior advisor to the Boston Consulting Group, a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, as an honorary chairman of the OSS Society, and on several additional corporate, nonprofit, and governmental boards. He holds a BA from the University of Alabama, an MBA from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, and a PhD from Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Vickers would certainly have met the criteria for what was described as an ideal OSS candidate, a PhD who can handle himself in a bar fight. And due to the virtual nature of tonight's event, I'm confident there won't be any bar fights. So please welcome Dr. Michael Vickers. Thank you, Charles. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 2020 will rightly be remembered as a god-awful year filled with plague, pestilence, locusts, and economic depression. It also marks the 75th anniversary of the disbandment of the OSS, so we're calling tonight's conversation OSS 75, its legacy and lessons. Joining us this evening are four distinguished panelists. Former Secretary of Defense and Director of Central Intelligence, Robert Gates. Former Secretary of Defense and Director of the Central Intelligence Agency, Leon Panetta. Former Commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command, Admiral William McRaven. And former Commander of U.S. Central Command and Director of the Central Intelligence Agency, General David Petraeus. All four of our panelists are recipients of the OSS Society's prestigious William J. Donovan Award, which recognizes an individual who has rendered distinguished service to the United States of America and demonstrates the exceptional characteristics and achievement of General Donovan. Secretary Gates, Secretary Panetta, Admiral McRaven, and General Petraeus are also all honorary chairmen of the National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations. I'm deeply honored to host this conversation. Our panelists include two former bosses and mentors of mine, and two of our nation's most distinguished warriors, and I'm proud to say former battle buddies of mine. Let me now introduce our panelists. Robert Gates was Secretary of Defense from 2006 to 2011. His record of national security service is without equal in the past several decades. He previously served as Director of Central Intelligence, the first officer to rise from entry-level employee to director, and as Deputy National Security Advisor during the collapse of the Soviet Empire, the end of the Cold War, and the Persian Gulf War. Before becoming DCI, he was Deputy Director of Central Intelligence, Deputy Director of Intelligence overseeing CIA's analytical arm, and served multiple tours on the National Security Council staff. After retiring from CIA, he served as president of Texas A&M before returning to government service as SecDef. He has a PhD in Soviet and Russian history, 
and is the author of four books, a memoir of his CIA career in the last two decades of the Cold War, memoir of his service as Secretary of Defense, a book on leadership of public institutions, and his most recent work, Exercise of Power, which covers the use and misuse of American power. Secretary Gates, welcome. It's great to see you again. Thanks, Mike. Leon Panetta served as Secretary of Defense from 2011 to 2013 and as Director of Cent the Central Intelligence Agency from 2009 to 2011. As CIA Director, he oversaw the campaign to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat Al-Qaeda and the raid that brought justice to Osama bin Laden. Previously, Secretary Panetta served as White House Chief of Staff, the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, the Chair of the House Budget Committee, and a congressman from California. Like Secretary Gates, his record of public service is extraordinary. His memoir, Worthy Fights, was published in 2014. Secretary Panetta, welcome. It's wonderful to see you. Good to be with you. Admiral William McRaven's career as a Navy SEAL began in 1977. He commanded at all levels in special warfare and served as White House counterterrorism advisor after the 9-11 attacks. He was commander of the Joint Special Operations Command from 2008 to 2011 and commander of U.S. Special Operations Command from 2011 to 2014. He commanded the operation that brought justice to Osama bin Laden and oversaw the operation that captured Saddam Hussein. He is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, special operators of the past half century. Most recently, he was chancellor of the University of Texas system my daughter Sophie's and his alma mater. He is the author of two books, a memoir of his career called Sea Stories, actually three books, I made a mistake, which was published in 2019, a work on special operations theory that grew out of his graduate school studies, and the greatest book of all, Make Your Bed, which provides wonderful advice to uh, college graduates. Bill, great to see you, hook em horns. Thanks Mike, good to be with you. General David Petraeus' career as an Army officer began in 1974 when he graduated from West Point in the top 5% of his class. He commanded airborne, air assault, and mechanized infantry units at all levels and earned a PhD from Princeton along the way. As a two-star, he led the 101st Airborne Division uh, in the invasion of Iraq. As commander of the Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth, he fundamentally reshaped our counterinsurgency doctrine and as a four-star, he commanded our forces in Iraq and Afghanistan and in the Central Command region. He then went on to serve as director of CIA. Goes without saying that Dave's record as a senior combat commander is without equal in the past half century. Dave, it's great to see you. Great to be with you. Thanks, Mike. And great to be with two of our secretaries of war when we were doing what Bill and I were doing together and Bill, the greatest shipmate any soldier ever had. Amen to all that. Uh, so we're going to conduct our conversation this evening in two parts. During the first half, we'll discuss the OSS's legacy and lessons, focusing on its impact on CIA and SOF, um, its, its two heirs. Given the extraordinary experience and expertise of our panelists, during the second half, we'll expand our discussion to the challenges facing America as we enter the third de decade of the 21st century. And in keeping with the broad theme of our conversation, I'll wrap up by asking our panelists a few questions on the future of intelligence and special operations. And afterwards, we'll allow plenty of time for audience questions. So let's begin. The disbandment of the OSS led to the establishment of two organizational heirs, the Central Intelligence Agency in 1947 and the US Army Special Forces in 1952. Both reflected strongly the ethos and capabilities of the OSS. Secretary Gates, let's begin with you. During your early years in the agency, you served under two OSS veterans as directors, Dick Helms and Bill Colby. And CIA during its early decades was staffed heavily by OSS veterans. How did the legacy of the OSS shape the establishment and evolution of CIA? And how did Helms and Colby's experience in OSS and then CIA shape their approach as directors? Well, Mike, I think, first of all, that's a very big subject, but I, I will focus on five traits that I think OSS uh, uh, bequeathed to CIA. 
and one organizational in, uh, innovation. The first, the first trait was boldness and, and being audacious. <clears throat> and I think an example of that uh, was the Berlin Tunnel, uh, which uh, Dick Helms oversaw. The second is uh, being imaginative. My favorite, one of my favorite operations, we had a terrorist cell operating in an uh, East German embassy in their, in their conference room. Uh, we needed to um, listen in on what was going on, but had no way to figure it out. Um, the housekeeper was an agent of ours and uh, let us know that there was a cat that slept most of the day in the conference room where the meetings of the terrorists were taking place. After a lot of planning, we kidnapped the cat. We planted a listening device in the cat where no one would pet the cat and released the cat back into the embassy and the cat returned to the conference room and we got the information. Uh, they called the operation Acousta Kitty. <laughs> the third characteristic was an aversion to bureaucracy. Uh, CIA is a like OSS, is a very hierarchical organization, but when it comes to operations and programs, it's very flat. When the rector wants to know something about a country or an issue, he, talks to the, he, he or she talks to the analyst. Uh, when he or she wants to know about an operation, they talk to the case officer. So there's hierarchy uh, administratively, but programmatically, uh, it's it's very flat. And another example of, of this um, getting away from bureaucracy, the U2 program was uh, first approved in uh, November of 1954. The contract for the planes was signed in March of 1955, and the first airplane was delivered in July of 1955. And the whole program came in under budget. A fourth characteristic, in my view, is um, the importance of uh, individual initiative, whether it's an analyst uh, or an operator in the field. Uh, once the instructions have been given, a great deal of flexibility is given to those carrying out the mission. And the fifth trait I would describe uh, is irreverence. And I think that goes without saying uh, for, for both, in, both CIA and special operations. Uh, the organizational innovation that um, CIA inherited from OSS was the research and analysis branch. And it, as, as much criticism as OSS endured over the years, the one part of OSS everybody admired was research, was RNA branch. And of course, they, they created, they invented uh, all source strategic intelligence analysis. They provided targeting information. They provided support to military operations, and they and they basically uh, provided broad strategic information on the Nazis. And this all, of course, was exactly what the Directorate of Intelligence ended up doing at CIA. So I think in these areas, uh, in particular, when I think of of what CIA inherited uh, 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 from OSS, the OSS legacy, those are the ones that come most <clears throat> to mind for me. You know, Secretary Panetta and Admiral McRaven, we could have used the Kusta Kitty for the bin Laden raid. <laughs> and and your story about the uh, uh, U2, uh, Secretary Gates, reminds me, I know you know him, former mentor of mine who passed away, Bert Dunn. His first assignment was as a case officer in Peshawar was helping with the U2 program. So, sir, as a senior officer during the 1980s, you served under another OSS veteran, Bill Casey. You described Casey and CIA in the 1980s as President Reagan's sword. From my own experiences, it was a great time to be a CIA officer as we led the charge in our final showdown with the Soviet Union. Tell us a bit about what it was like to serve under Director Casey and how his OSS experience shaped his approach to intelligence, covert action, and destroying the Soviet Union. Well, every day working for Bill Casey was interesting. I don't <laughs> recall ever being bored. Uh, first of all, you need to understand, Casey saw himself as very much as the heir to Bill Donovan. And in fact, the only piece of personal memorabilia that Casey had in his office when he was DCI was a signed photograph, a sepia-toned uh, photograph of Bill Donovan. 
Uh, I think I think Casey uh, reflected his OSS experience very very much and 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 very consciously. He he had been in OSS to wage war against the Nazis and it was an all-out war. He saw his role as director of central intelligence under Reagan under Ronald Reagan is to wage war against the Soviet Union. War without limits, war everywhere necessary. And so uh, the, in the hidden hand and often more often than not, the not so hidden hand in Central America, in Africa, in Afghanistan, in Poland, uh, in all of these places, uh, Casey was, was very active. Um, the second, uh, the second uh, thing that I think reflected his OSS, OSS experience was the role that he cast for the Directorate of Intelligence in support of operations. And it was really Casey for the first time in 1986 when he created the Counterintelligence uh, Counterterrorism Center at CIA that a cadre of analysts were actually moved out of the Directorate of Intelligence and into the Directorate of Operations to support uh, planning for counter-terrorist operations. And that, that action in 1986 laid the foundation for what would later in, to, in 2011 uh, inform uh, the raid that killed uh, Osama bin Laden. The third legacy of OSS for Casey was that uh, the OSS had no uh, congressional oversight. <laughs> and and Bill Casey thought that was just great. That was just the way you ought to run an intelligence organization. And I think Leon will agree that that Bill Casey was guilty of contempt of Congress from the very first day he reported for work. And that never changed in the whole time he was director. And he really I mean, he really resented uh, uh, the uh, uh, intelligence oversight because it was so different from his experience in, in the OSS. And the fourth and final characteristic that I think he inherited was uh, his impatience with bureaucracy. And, and the truth is often when Bill wanted to get something done, he would ignore the bureaucracy or go around the bureaucracy. Sometimes this led to considerable uh, success and sometimes it led to disaster as in the case of Iran Contra. So, Bill Casey was very much a child of the OSS, and, and he ran the CIA as though he were Bill Donovan. Yeah, I remember, sir, someone would talk to him about, uh, why don't we use C-130s to airdrop uh, supplies to the resistance in Afghanistan, and it wasn't a great idea given Soviet air defenses, but uh, he certainly had no shortage of trying anything. Um, Secretary Panetta and General Petraeus, you both served as directors after 9-11. What do you think the impact of the OSS was on our approach to the war with Al-Qaeda uh, and on the organizational culture of CIA several decades forward? Secretary Panetta, let's start with you. Well, I, I, I can remember uh, when I first went to uh, CIA as the new director uh, and uh, sat down with uh, with Mike Hayden, my predecessor, uh, who kind of briefed me on uh, obviously a lot of the areas that uh, CIA was involved with, and you know my my experience with CIA was uh, solely on the intelligence side uh, as uh, as chief of staff, uh, as a member of Congress, uh, you basically focused on uh, the intelligence uh, work that uh, CIA was doing, and when I came back to Washington at that time, I just assumed that uh, a lot of it was focused on gathering intelligence. Uh, and Mike pulled me aside and he said uh, at one point, he said, look, he says, you're not only going to be a director of the CIA, you're gonna be a combatant commander. Yeah. I said, uh, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and Mike soon, soon told me about, uh, you know, the operations that CIA uh, was conducting, uh, particularly in Pakistan, uh, going after Al Qaeda leadership. And it told me that, uh, that indeed, uh, the work of the CIA was not just uh, intelligence gathering, there was an operational side that I think very much reflected what OSS was all about. 
uh, in, in terms of being able to go after, not only identify who the bad guys are, but to actually target those bad guys and, uh, and go after them. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the relationship that was developed between intelligence and the military, I think is very much based on uh, the OSS model in the sense that if the combination of good intelligence plus the ability to carry out a mission uh, in special forces uh, did that. I mean, when we went after targets in Afghanistan and in Iraq, it was a tremendous combination of good intelligence and good special forces uh, operations. The whole counterterrorism approach that we took, and that still is present, uh, I think in many ways uh, reflects back to the OSS. And all of that, obviously, Mike, as you know, and as Bill McRaven knows, all of that came together in the bin Laden operation. We had intelligence. We were able to identify uh, the elements of, uh, of a compound and the possibility that bin Laden was there. And when I was asked to uh, conduct uh, operations, what I did was go to Bill McRaven at Special Forces, and I said, Bill, uh, I need you to develop uh, the operation itself. And that combination of great intelligence plus the SEALs uh, operating as great Special Forces is what ultimately uh, was a success in that mission. So it really was a reflection of the OSS. I always felt deep down inside of me uh, that, uh, that the, the old troopers of the OSS would be very proud of what we were doing. Indeed. Uh, Dave, uh, your thoughts on uh, how it impacted our approach to the war with Al-Qaeda and, and, and CIA uh, several decades on? Well, certainly the qualities that Secretary Gates described are very, very present today. And the consciousness of the legacy that has been handed down from generation to generation dating back to the OSS and Wild Bill Donovan and so forth is very keenly uh, no noted and, and observed both in the CIA and certainly uh, in our military special operations forces. You know, I spent nearly seven of my final 10 years in uniform deployed before joining the CIA. And in every one of those assignments, uh, actually starting in 2001, uh, when I was part of the war criminal hunt, uh, dual-hatted as a U.S. one-star, uh, I was a NATO uh, assigned officer at that time. Uh, but that's where the CIA was working very closely with special mission units, some that uh, Bill would later command. Uh, and it actually is the place where the first operation, first counterterrorism operation was carried out after 9-11, was in Sarajevo, actually not... Uh, in Afghanistan, which didn't come for a couple of weeks later. Uh, and seeing this combination of, again, CIA, uh, plus, by the way, FBI and other members of the intelligence community, to be sure, uh, and then our special operations forces together there, then seeing it again during the invasion of Iraq in the first year there, then in the subsequent tour, certainly during the surge, when the partnership between JSOC uh, and its special mission unit elements uh, in Iraq, uh, acting oftentimes with CIA intelligence uh, to drive the targeting was just extraordinary. That was when, of course, General Stan McChrystal uh, developed JSOC into what became a true machine that was every single night conducting 10 to 15 uh, targeted operations uh, to capture or, if necessary, kill the irreconcilables, noting that, of course, uh, with Secretary Gates' encouragement, uh, we had launched an effort to reconcile with the rank and file uh, of the Sunni insurgents and the Shia militia and then intensified uh, the effort to capture or kill the irreconcilables. And that went on through U.S. Central Command. And sadly, unlike with Secretary Gates, I don't think the operations that uh, Bill and I and the agency did in those years are yet declassified, all of them. Obviously, some are, such as the operation to get bin Laden. That night, by the way, I had to chop Bill McRaven from essentially being under me to being under Leon and, uh, and monitor the operation because we were on the hook for a lot of contingencies if things went south. 
Uh, and when that first helicopter crashed, I started reviewing those contingencies with a great deal more interest. Um, but, you know, on through those years, and let me just give two very quick vignettes that sort of emphasize what Secretary Gates uh, outlined up front. I remember in Bosnia, we'd actually detained a number of Pakistanis. It turned out that there was a basically a pipeline that went from Pakistan through Sarajevo and then into the Schengen zone. They were facilitated by some non-government organizations that we subsequently shut down uh, in operations there in Bosnia. Uh, but we didn't know what to do with these guys initially. They weren't bad enough to push up the system. So we figured, well, we'll just turn them around, put them on a plane, send them back to Pakistan. But of course, the military couldn't generate cash for me to do this on a really quick basis. So I went to see the CIA station chief, uh, asked him if he could spare $27,000. He turned around, the safe was already open. He counted it out, gave it to me. And he said, oh, by the way, could you sign a buck slip for me? And that was when I started to realize that, you know, this is the kind of organization I might like to be at at some point in time. Um, and then later on, and literally on my first day as the director of the CIA, um, went in in that first meeting. And of course, you always sit at the center of the table, not the head of it, as is the custom uh, for a director. Uh, but I'd been looking at the operations for some weeks prior to that. Uh, and then just waiting to retire and join the organization. And so in that first day, I asked the deputy director for operations whether we had enough chemical weapons expertise on the ground in Libya. Uh, we, we, Gaddafi had not yet been toppled. We had, uh, there were no boots on the ground, as you may recall, but there were some sneakers on the ground and it was CIA officers that were filling those. Uh, and one of the big concerns was a bunker of chemical weapons that was suspected of being at a certain location. And our, for, our oper, operators were developing an indigenous force that could go down there and secure that bunker and then figure out what we were going to do with it. Um, anyway, I asked the deputy director to come up with some options for the next morning. We went in the next morning. I said, well, how have you developed the options, lay them out for me, please. And he said, oh, heck, director, you were right. We took a look at it. We did need some more chemical weapons expertise. You know, the guys are on the plane. They should be arriving, actually, in about two hours from now. And I realized then, you know, we didn't have to submit a request for orders. Uh, it didn't have to work its way up a chain of command. It didn't have to wait for the secretary on a Thursday to sign the orders book, uh, the only day of the week, unless it was an emergency. Uh, and then to source it, conduct the pre-deployment training, and finally get them out to the theater. Uh, so this, again, really exemplifies what Secretary Gates was talking about, this uh, ability to just make things happen, uh, the initiative, uh, the flexibility, uh, all of this was really extraordinary. And of course, uh, in an organization of truly silent warriors, quiet professionals, who didn't talk about what it was that they did uh, with their neighbors, uh, didn't have retirement parades like Bill and I had uh, when we ended our time in the military. Uh, and so again, extraordinary servants of our country uh, with all of those qualities really that distinguished the OSS uh, and then were passed on to the CIA and also to Bill McRaven's great special operators. Yeah, I, re I remember, Dave, when you uh, took over CIA and you saw the size of its budget, not to go into classified details, but you thought a few do zeros were missing at the end for everything that was accomplished, which was a pretty good testament. I have, In fact, uh, I had a briefing on it. I was still in Afghanistan preparing for the confirmation hearing. And I remember saying, OK, well, that's great. But now tell me about the black budget. And they said, no, no, that's it. Um, yeah. And, you know, of course, there we were spending $100 billion in Afghanistan just on the military that year. I can't talk about what fraction of that uh, was the CIA, but America gets a great deal uh, out of a little that goes to the CIA. Indeed. Well, let's now turn uh, to the impact of the OSS on our special operations forces. Bill, you began your career in SOF in 1977. I know the special forces were heavily shaped by and traced part of their origin to the OSS. I believe the SEALs do as well. What do you see as the impact of OSS on SOF from its founding to today? And if you could also address 
Secretary Panetta's comments about the relationship between CIA and the military during your time as a senior commander. Yeah, thanks, Mike. You know, I think when you when you think back on the legacy of the OSS, and frankly, to some degree, the mythology that goes along with that legacy, it really is embedded in, in everything we know as, as special operators. When you walk into the headquarters building of the U.S. Special Operations Command, there is a portrait of General Donovan, just like there is a CIA headquarters. So we recognize, we understand, we, we also acknowledge that there is an expectation that as special operators, we will have those characteristics that Secretary Gates was talking about that we will be bold, that we will be daring, that we will be unconventional. I mean, that, that hangs over us every day, rightfully so. But you also look back on how the OSS operated. I mean, they were a global organization. During World War II, you know, there were operators in China, in Burma, uh, in North Africa, in Europe. The special operations community kind of takes that same model. I mean, we are spread globally around the world. You know, it used to be in 100 different countries. Uh, small units, again, much like the OSS was. We also recognize the importance of partnering and leveraging those partners. And, and frankly, nobody did it better during World War II than the OSS. You think of the Jedbergs, you think of our relationship with the Special Operations Executive and the resistance elements. Uh, and, and so again, part of the DNA of Special Operations is a recognition that, you know, be bold, be daring, operate globally, partner with the people that can help you leverage their skill sets, and then also the technology. And again, Secretary Gates talked about, uh, you know, the, the SR-71. I think about things like the, the Lamberson rig, the, the first, uh, you know, kind of closed circuit or scuba rig that was developed by the OSS that later, you know, was an instrumental part of the, uh, the Raiders that became, you know, the, the Navy SEALs. Uh, you think about little simple things like the the Fairbanks Sykes knife. You think about covert communications and uh, and weapon systems. This idea that we were going to think out of the box from the standpoint of technology also is part and parcel to who we are as special operations. And, and probably uh, you know one or two more things. I think about the role of SOF as being strategic in nature. They may be tactical operations, yeah. but there is an expectation that they will have a strategic impact on the fight. Uh, so it's not that we don't do tactical missions, but, but when you really think of special operations, the application is let's have a strategic impact with, you know, small boots on the ground. And that was clearly, uh, you know, a part and parcel to the OSS. And then, uh, you know, uh, what we've done, however, is we've taken these kind of glorious amateurs and I hope we have turned them into glorious professionals. Uh, we have, we have taken, you know, folks and made them professional in communications, professional in boats, professional in weapon systems, uh, so that the special operations community today, as we trace our lineage all the way back to, to Wild Bill Donovan, hopefully everything about the OSS is still part of our DNA, but instead of being amateurs, we have professionalized it to the point where, again, hopefully it provides great value to, uh, uh, to this country, and I, I know that it does. All right. Um, I feel like a B-2 pilot. We're hitting all our targets right on time here, so uh, you guys are wonderful. Uh, let's now talk about challenges to America in the decade ahead. Most national security analysts describe our current and emerging uh, national security environment as principally characterized by great power competition, most notably with China, and revolutionary technological change that promises to fundamentally transform both wealth and power. But there's also a revanchist Russia with its aggressive use of information warfare, hybrid warfare, and an escalate to de-escalate strategy should overt war break out. The continued proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, particularly by North Korea and Iran, and the continued, albeit currently reduced, threat from global jihadists, and a number of other challenges arising from the downsides of globalization, uh, ranging from pandemic disease and global warming to economic dislocation. Most worrisome, in, in my view, is the increasing polarization of American society and our increasing inability to unite for a common purpose. Secretary Gates, let's start again with you. What do you um, see as our principal national security challenges in the decade ahead, and how do we need to reposition ourselves to better tackle them? I know you wrote a, a lot about this in your most recent book. 
Well, I think they're the usual geographic suspects. You mentioned China, Russia, uh, Iran, North Korea, and so on. I think I think that's all a pretty familiar list. I would tell you when I get asked this question most of the time, I say that I believe that the greatest, genuinely, the, the greatest threat to the national security of the United States right now can be found within the two square miles that encompass the White House and the Capitol building. Because if we can't figure out how to get past the paralysis in Washington, which uh, is affecting us all over the world, uh, there is no foreign threat, in my view, that is as dangerous to our future as that paralysis in Washington. But that said, the, the geographic threats that, that have been mentioned, I would, I would single out also cyber. I think cyber is the most dangerous weapon of all because it can be used for political purposes, military purposes, uh, for economic purposes. It's sort of the all-purpose weapon uh, attribute. Uh, being able, figuring out how to attribute it is, it can often be difficult, so you don't know who has hit you. So I think I think that's the probably the the greatest single weapon uh, danger to the United States. But I would I would conclude by saying I think that the what is necessary now is is to realize that we are operating under a national security structure that was developed in 1947 to fight the Cold War, and that whole national security structure is outdated. And we need to completely revise uh, the way we look at national security, the participants in the process, the way that decisions get made, and so on. And, and I would add, I think we're in for a very long uh, rivalry with China. Uh, hopefully, we can do this in the context of peaceful coexistence. But because a military confrontation would be catastrophic for both sides, just as was the case in the Cold War, the reality is this rivalry will be carried out using primarily non-military instruments of power. And it's those instruments that have largely been dismantled in the wake of the Cold War, whether it's strategic communications or development assistance, uh, many of our economic tools. Um, uh, and so I think that, and, and frankly, also the way we use intelligence uh, in our dealings with other countries and, and the role of intelligence uh, as a non-military instrument of power. So we need to, and, and when, you know, I'm, I'm sure that my colleagues will agree with me, when people speak of a whole of government effort, it's a joke, it's a sham, there is no such thing. We have no, we have no coordination, there is no strategy that encompasses all of the elements of government in dealing with any one of these tools. And, and that's why I believe that the structure needs to be changed uh, and and brought into the 21st century for the world that we face today. Dave, uh, what are your thoughts on our principal national security challenges and uh, the need for national security reform? Well, I would characterize the challenges that we face right now as the most complex, uh, perhaps since the end of World War II. Um, if you think about it, even actually when all the four of us, the five of us were last in government, um, we didn't ha even have yet the fully fledged uh, resurgence of great power rivalries, if you will. Um, in fact, the five of us, when we were in government, largely were focused on the threat of Islamist extremists in a variety of different places. Um, and, you know, we'd actually retooled our military, actually, in all, every which way to prepare our leaders, our forces, organizations, equipment, uh, indeed, to combat those successfully. Uh, and then since then, we've added, as, as was noted, the uh, extraordinary rise of China, the return of Russia. You, you obviously still have Iran and North Korea out there. The cyber threats that Secretary Gates has highlighted, the challenges of uh, partisan gridlock at home, uh, and, and all the rest of that, even the challenges to democracies around the world in general uh, of the rise of populism in each of those. And of course, the addition of an entirely new battlefield domain, uh, that of cyberspace. And so I think it really is about the complexity that is out there. It can only be addressed by the whole of government's approach. And by the way, it's not even whole of government, it should have an S on the end because we always wanna do this 
with our partners and allies as big a coalition as we can possibly muster for any of the challenges. And so I think the way we have to think about what it is that we are now uh, as a superpower with this complex array of challenges is as the guy in the circus who's the plate spinner. You know, he gets the plate up and he gets it spinning. And by the way, there's one plate, of course, that matters more than all the others. That is the plate that represents uh, China and the U.S.-China relationship, the most important in the world. But there are many others as well. Uh, other uh, powers that aren't satisfied with the status quo, the revisionist powers, Russia, Iran, North Korea, again, still extremists, cyber threats, a uh, host of other issues and challenges, including some on the home front that we have to deal with. And that's a lot of plates to keep spinning. And, and again, I think it is right to question whether the structure and the processes and so forth that we have right now are actually adequate to deal with all of this. And certainly, uh, I agree with the, the major theme of Secretary Gates' latest book, which is essentially uh, that we don't have the rest of the components of a whole of government approach uh, sufficiently resourced or sufficiently in the game uh, to complement the military tools that we do have that are so very, very capable. Um, so that's, I think, the way we have to think about this. Uh, and again, the degree of complexity is very, very considerable, and it is even greater, again, than what each of us faced uh, during our last stint in government. Secretary Panetta, you're the only one here with significant domestic policy experience. And the erosion of the domestic bases of our mm -hmm. national power has moved to cent center stage as a national security issue, Secretary Gates and uh, General Petraeus just mentioned. What do we need to do uh, to reunify the country and right America's ship of state? Big question again, I know, but uh, welcome your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it certainly is. Uh, and uh, in many ways, uh, Tuesday will tell us a lot about what path we take into the future. Uh, in, my, uh, in my 50 years, over 50 years of public life, uh, I, I've often said I've seen Washington at its best and Washington at its worst. Uh, the good news is I've seen Washington work. And I think uh, that's that's true for all of us uh, that are here. Uh, the, you know, we've had experience with uh, with a Washington in which Democrats and Republicans were willing to work together on major issues. I mean, when I first went back to Washington, I was a legislative assistant to a Republican senator from California, a guy named Tom Kegel who was a minority whip under Everett Dirksen. Uh, and the Republicans then, people like Javits and Case from New Jersey, uh, these are Republicans, and Hugh Scott, uh, Mark Hatfield, George Aiken. Uh, they were working with Democrats like Henry Jackson and Dick Russell and, uh, you know, Symington, uh, Fulbright, uh, and others. Uh, they worked with them on major issues. It wasn't a question of whether they would or wouldn't. They did. Uh, and in working together, they were able to accomplish landmark legislation in a number of areas. When I got elected to Congress in 1976, Tip O'Neill was the speaker, kind of, you know, a Democrat's Democrat from, from Boston. But he had a great relationship with Bob Michael, who was the minority leader from Illinois. And did they have their political differences? Of course. But when it came to major issues, they worked together whether it was a Democratic president or a Republican president. I mean, my God, under Ronald Reagan, uh, we passed Social Security reform on a bipartisan basis. Imagine. We passed tax reform on a bipartisan basis. We passed immigration reform on a bipartisan basis. We dealt with budgets. We dealt with treaties. We dealt with foreign policy on a bipartisan basis. Uh, because... Frankly, governing was good politics. Mm -hmm. To govern was good politics. And now what we've seen is Washington at its worst over these last 15 or 20 years. It's become more partisan, more divided. Uh, the parties are in their trenches. Nobody wants to go into no man's land to try to work together because they're afraid they'll get shot in the back. Uh, and uh, Washington generally has become dysfunctional, not only in Congress. I mean, my goodness, 
you, you can't get the president and the Congress to work together on major issues facing the country. Uh, Bob Gates is right. This is, this is the major national security issue. Because if this country can't deal with major problems that we're facing, then you know you can have the finest defense in the world, but if we're falling apart, it doesn't do you a hell of a lot of good. And so because of this dysfunction, I mean, look what's happening. We couldn't develop a COVID-19 aid package, for goodness sakes, in the middle of an emergency. For whatever reason, they couldn't come together, the president, the Congress, or the House, or the Senate. Uh, we haven't, they've both talked about infrastructure and how important infrastructure is to our country, and it is. It's a national security issue, frankly. Uh, but no matter the fact that they all support it, nothing has happened on infrastructure. Uh, you look at uh, issues like health reform or immigration reform. We know immigration, is, our immigration process is broken. We've known it for 10 years, for goodness sakes. And for whatever reason, they couldn't come together to develop comprehensive immigration reform. So in area after area, it has become totally dysfunctional. And there's a lack of leadership that is willing to take the risks associated with leadership, frankly. As we all know, you know, those in the military know this better than anybody. If you're gonna be a leader, you gotta take risks. And if you're not willing to take risks, you're not gonna lead, crisis will lead. And that's what's happening now. I, I tell the students here at the Panetta Institute, we govern either by leadership or crisis. If leadership isn't there, then crisis will, will dominate. How do we fix this? Uh, it isn't, you know, it isn't something that's going to simply be solved from the top down. I think it's only going to be solved from the bottom up by new people who are elected to Congress. Uh, and, and I've seen that because my youngest son just got elected to Congress two, two elections ago. And Jimmy, you know, served in Afghanistan, got the Bronze Star, uh, and uh, he saw Washington at my time, where Republicans and Democrats got together. But when he went back, like other veterans who had gotten elected, they didn't want to go there and just pound their shoe on the table. And so there are groups of newer members, this Problem Solvers Caucus, that is working together to try to find solutions. And I think that ultimately, it's going to take time, but that ultimately it's going to take newer members who are willing to get back to governing our democracy. And it's going to take a president who's willing to exercise the leadership necessary to be able to work with both Republicans and Democrats. It's not easy, but I'm afraid that if our democracy doesn't get back to the business of governing, this will be an issue that will raise the question whether our democracy can survive. Uh, so our, for our last topic, I want to talk just a bit about the future of intelligence and special operations. Um, Secretary Gates, let me start with you. If you were DCI again, so both DNI and DCIA wrapped in one in 2021, what changes would you make to our intelligence priorities, capabilities, and organization? I know, again, big topic. But... Well, first of all, perish the thought. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that said, you know, I uh, very strongly opposed the creation in 2004 of the DNI. Yeah. I felt that uh, the, the inadequacies that had been identified by the 9-11 Commission could have been uh, addressed by uh, empowering the director of central intelligence in several ways, including giving him two deputies, one, him or her two deputies, one for CIA and one for the intelligence community. And, and Leon can attest to this, and, and Dave also for that matter. It, it's crazy to be in the situation room and have two intelligence officials yeah. representing intelligence. And which one really uh, speaks for the intelligence, for, for, is the intelligence advisor to the president and under the law, it's the DNI, but more often than not, the president turns to the DCIA. So the first thing I would do is uh, rewind the tape. And I would eliminate the DNI. Uh, I would empower the uh, the DCI. I'd make him. I, 
I lost my earbud. What about your other, your other? Um, I would empower the DCI. Uh, you could fold some of the DNI structure under that. Um, but I think I think it needs to be streamlined. I think there's a big uh, bureaucracy that has grown up. People predicted that a big bureaucracy would grow up under the DNI. They were absolutely right. I've always said that the DNI and DHS is what you get when the Congress designs executive branch organizations. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, and uh, so that's the first thing I would do. Then I, the second thing I would do is we need to find a way to restore both the appearance and the reality of an apolitical independent intelligence service that tells it like it is, um, whatever the consequences. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with uh, secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, and national security advisors yelling at me about things that CIA had, had produced. But I never had anybody tell me that I had to take it back or that I had to change it. And they knew what the answer would be. And I would say that was true of my predecessors as well. Dick Helms had some terrific fights uh, in the Nixon administration over Vietnam assessments, over Soviet weapon systems with Secretary Mel Laird and, and a variety of others. So restoring the independence and the appearance of integrity. I mean, we ha I think that we have the reality of integrity. We need to restore the appearance of that integrity for the American people as well as for the Congress. And then finally, I would say there needs to be a concerted effort to, to, to reemphasize to the professionals in the intelligence community those characteristics of OSS that I described in my very first remarks. Bill, how do you think SOFT needs to evolve to better meet the demands of the new national security environment? Yeah, well, of course, you know, the nature of special operations really is about adaptability and, and to your point about, you know, evolving to meet the needs. I mean, again, I think this goes back to our, our OSS roots. Uh, but first and foremost, SOFT has to understand right up front, you know, what it can and cannot do. I mean, SOFT can't stop the North Koreans if they decide to come south. I and mean, we, we can't stop the Chinese from invading Taiwan. Uh, you know, we can't stop the Russians from moving into Estonia. You know, the, the, you're going to need large conventional forces to do that. Um, but obviously, SOFT can, can play a very important role. But I think there's kind of four things that SOFT has to think about as we look at kind of the changing dynamic globally. Uh, first and foremost is don't take your eye off the terrorism threat and the asymmetric threats that are out there. You know, I go back to the 1990s and there was this big push within the, the broader military called the Revolution in Military Affairs, RMA. And all the services were doing, you know, kind of un taking unconventional approaches to kind of conventional fights. You know, how are the Marines going to learn to land on the beach differently? How is the Navy going to employ uh, their ships differently? But at the end of the day, it was about, you know, major theater war. And then all of a sudden 9-11 happened and we all went off to, to kind of Iraq and Afghanistan. So we don't want to get to the point where we forget about the importance and the threat that is uh, that is out there from terrorism and, again, other asymmetric threats. I think from the soft standpoint, what we learned over and over again uh, in our time in Iraq and Afghanistan is the need to work with the conventional forces. Now, the conventional forces are going to have, you know, gaps and seams in some of their capabilities. So what can SOFT do, what can Special Operations Forces do uh, that might be able to, to fill up those, uh, those gaps? Things like, uh, you know, surgical strikes and raids and intelligence gathering where, you know, the conventional forces can leverage our unique capability to, to kind of make them better. Third thing I would say is uh, the interagency aspect of Special Operations. What really got accelerated after 9-11 was the relationship uh, between the Special Operations Forces and all the members of, of the interagency. Of course, particularly the CIA, the National Security Agency, but of course also DIA and the National Geospatial Agency and the FBI and their kind of long arm of the law. I've seen uh, those relationships start to atrophy a little bit as we have you know, pulled out of theater. And, and I don't think that's a good thing for the country. So we really need to, to continue to work on those, continue to enhance those, because uh, I think as Secretary Panetta said earlier, 
uh, and Secretary Gates and, and Dave Petraeus. At the end of the day, when we're looking at tough strategic targets, this relationship between special operations and the intelligence community or in the interagency is vital to kind of solving some of those difficult problems. And finally, the one thing we know in special operations is people are our most important asset. The, the number one rule of, of SOF is people are more important than hardware. So as we adapt and as we you know, look at uh, the fact that you know, most of the guys in the special operations community have been in this fight for a very, very long time, we have to take care of our people first or we're not going to be able to evolve in a way that's gonna be meaningful uh, for the force or for the nation. Okay, we have time. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, time for a couple of uh, audience questions. Uh, I'm getting them here on my text uh, phone. Um, some of them are specific and, and others are uh, general to, to our four panelists. Um, so let me start with some of the specific ones. Um, Secretary Gates, you talked about the need uh, um, that uh, or that our the observation that our national security structure is outdated, uh, that this uh, writer concurs with you. And you said the way decisions are made and participants uh, in the process needs to change. Um, could you expound on that a bit and perhaps provide a specific example maybe of a functional case uh, to illustrate the point? Well, I'll give you two examples. Um, one is that, um, we need to realize that the under the statute, there are only four members of the National Security Council, the president, the vice president, the secretary of state, and the secretary of defense. Uh, the chairman and the DNI are statutory advisors, but only advisors. How can it be that in the 21st century, there is no one at the table under the law that has anything to do with international economics? How can it be that we have multiple agencies that have strategic communications capabilities and programs and there is no single coordinating enterprise in the entire America in the that that makes sure they're speaking with one voice and one message to the rest of the world uh, USI, USIA was abolished in the late 1990s um, strategic communications was tucked into a corner of the State Department but DOD, CIA, everybody has uh, some element of strategic communications and there's no coherence to it. You know, an example of where government-wide coordination can be made to work is actually in a, in a different arena and, and I write about it in the book. And that was President Bush's program for uh, PEPFAR for Africa to deal with HIV AIDS. And the, rate, the way it worked, he actually named a coordinator for this program in the Department of State, but he empowered that coordinator to control all of the budgets relating to HIV AIDS and programs throughout the entire government. So that the government really did work as, as a coordinated, strategically directed whole. We need to figure out how we do that in a variety of other areas without necessarily creating a bunch of new agencies. Secretary Panetta, anything uh, uh, you'd like to add to that? Uh, your thoughts on, do we have the right people in place for the challenges we face? Well, I, you know, I, I, I agree with, uh, with uh, Bob Gates' analysis. Uh, and I, I think, I think it, it began to get out of kilter uh, as I mean, what, what happens is that in the White House, uh, the White House becomes centralized, and it really doesn't. You know, it's gotten to the point where it really doesn't make very good use of the State Department, or for that matter, even the Defense Department, because they've got you know 400 people who are operating. Uh, within the White House in the, in the national security process. Yeah. And so all of the expertise that you're supposed to be developing at state with the ambassadors, et cetera, uh, or at defense, suddenly gets down to a, a group of, of young staffers who are working uh, in the White House who have tremendous influence because of proximity to the President of the United States. And so, 
rather than having a process that really works, as Bob pointed out, with the Secretary of Defense, with the Secretary of State, with the key uh, people, Vice President, et cetera, uh, in the national security, you've got, you've got this situation where there are young staffers who, because of their instincts about where the president may or may not want to go, suddenly develop their approach to how you're going to deal with national security issues. And they drive that within the National Security Council so that by the time the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of State sit at the table, uh, the pot's already been cooked. And that that creates a situation where you are not getting giving the president the very best advice he needs. And that advice may be different. I may have a different view than the Secretary of State may have a different view. But very frankly, the President of the United States needs access to those views. It shouldn't be pre-cooked. Uh, that's, that's frankly why the President's elected, is to be able to make those kind of decisions based on the best advice he can get. And somehow we have got to streamline that process so that only the key people who are appointed in these key positions have the ability to provide their advice directly to the President of the United States, rather than having everything uh, pre-done because it's all contained in the White House and not really a, a national security process really does not take place anymore as it should. So I'm gonna pile on to what, what Leon said with just one factoid. And that is by 2011, as I was on my way out the door as secretary, the National Security Council had as many people working on National Security Council staff, had as many people working on Afghanistan and Iraq in the old executive office building as there were civilians in all of the provincial reconstruction teams in Afghanistan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which, we could not, which we couldn't man, as you'll recall, Secretary Gates, yeah, uh, exactly. with folks from the State Department. And, and you may recall having to call up reserve military officers and put them in civilian clothes to flesh out the PRTs in, in Iraq during the surge. Uh, so Bill and Dave, here's a question for you two, uh, given your vast experience in, in, in the Middle East. Um, the questioner raises the concern that as we rightly refocus on great power competition, um, do we run the risk of another 9-11 as we did in the years before 9-11 by, you know, sort of uh, uh, over reducing our presence in the Middle East. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Bill, let's start with you. Yeah, well, it's it's certainly a concern. And I think this is what, you know, the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman and the combatant commanders do. I mean, you, you're going to have to make trade-offs. Uh, as uh, the secretaries well know and Dave well knows, you know, I, I can tell you from my time at SOCOM, we would do quarterly uh, kind of war gaming with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs to figure out how are we going to allocate forces? Uh, it, it is always going to be a bit of a give and take. So if we're going to focus more on China, if we're going to do the, you know, the, the, the swing to Asia, so to speak, then we're going to have to take a hard look at, you know, what is going to be the force levels in Afghanistan? What are we going to leave in Iraq? What are we going to have in Bahrain? How are we going to do this? But this is a, uh, again, these are kind of ongoing discussions that occur, you know, 365 days a year with the leadership within the Pentagon. And I think in general, you know, the military will be able to provide the right advice to the Secretary of Defense and to the President to figure the best balance for that. Dave? You know, I think the, the challenge is um, to end endless wars responsibly. I mean, all of us understand deeply the desire to end endless wars, but we also have seen firsthand what happens if you try to end the war when actually what you're really doing is ending your involvement in a war uh, before there is a durable solution to that war. Um, I remember I used to want to raise my hand and say, excuse me, but we actually haven't ended the war in Iraq. What we are ending is our involvement in the war in Iraq. The war is going to continue um, and we may well end up back there because we actually pulled out prematurely. 
So the challenge, I think, is to how to have what is by necessity, I think, in many of these cases, a sustained commitment that is sustainable. And sustainability, obviously, is ma measured in the expenditure of blood and treasure. And, and the truth is, I think, that the American people are okay with sustained commitments. Goodness, we've had tens of thousands of troops in Korea, Japan, Europe, a variety of other places uh, over the years and around the world, uh, as long as, again, there is not an excessive cost in terms of uh, blood and treasure. And that is the art, I think, of figuring out how is it that we can train and equip, advise and assist and enable, and the enable is a really critical element, uh, host nation forces so that they can continue to uh, fight these enemies uh, whom will do violence to us uh, if we do not keep an eye on them and, and do not, again, maintain the pressure that is necessary to prevent them from reestablishing the kind of sanctuary that al-Qaeda had in Afghanistan when the 9-11 attacks were planned there, uh, or take your eye off the Islamic State, uh, and then it gets back up off its stomach and drifts into Syria and comes back with a vengeance, establishes a caliphate on the ground and uh, in cyberspace, a virtual caliphate. And in each case, then, we've had to do something very substantial in response. And so if we could get to this point of, a, again, a sustainable, sustained commitment, uh, especially in these areas, and these will continue to be irregular wars uh, in which soft will be very, very still high demand and still probably low density. Uh, that's, I think, the approach that is warranted, even as we rightly shift our focus much more heavily to the Indo-Pacific region. I think we have time uh, for just two more questions and we'll wrap up or maybe we'll see how we do. Uh, Bill, the first one is for you. Um, the questioner points out that uh, women have played a prominent operational role in CIA going back decades, you know, uh, in the war in Al Qaeda, uh, taking out a lot of Al Qaeda people off the battlefield, um, and then in uh, clandestine operations operating on the streets of Moscow and elsewhere, we've now opened up uh, all uh, um, positions in the military up to women. Uh, what do you think the future is of women in, in, in SOF and particularly Special Forces and your tribe SEALs? Well, you know, to your point, uh, Mike, uh, you know, when we look at uh, the the nature of special operations forces, you know, we are, you know, welcoming, uh, you know, women and everybody that is qualified to help us uh, solve the problem. When, when we were in Afghanistan, uh, I found as the JSOC commander that when we would go on target, the one problem we had was we couldn't really uh, interview or interrogate the women on target. The yeah. Afghan men wouldn't do it because they knew it was culturally inappropriate. And the American men really couldn't do it because their Afghan counterparts knew that that was, uh, again, culturally inappropriate. So sometimes uh, the women who really had most, a lot of the intelligence, uh, we were not able to question them. So much like our special forces colleagues did, we created the cultural support teams, brought women uh, you know, through, the, through a process in Fort Bragg. And let me tell you, if there was ever any doubt that women were in combat, they were in combat every single night with our units uh, in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And of course, they did a magnificent job and we could not have done the missions without them. So uh, so I, I don't, uh, again, I, I kind of put that way in the past. We kind of got, got past that a long time ago. Now, uh, you know, women making it through ranger school and uh, there are I don't know, 20 or 30 women that have made it through ranger school. There are now women that have gone through uh, Green Beret selection. And I have no doubt that in time, there will be women that will uh, will make it through SEALs and uh, you know, and, and it'll be great to have them in our ranks. But believe me, the women who were doing what you were describing, Bill, uh, made no secret of the fact of, of how annoyed they were that they didn't get combat pay because they weren't supposed to be in combat. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, Secretary and, Gates, and just as you say, they were. They were. Yeah. Secretary Gates, the last question is for you. Um, the questioner, uh, asserts, I think, correctly, that uh, the Russians seem to have gotten the better of us the past um, several years. 
uh, beginning in Ukraine and then uh, Syria and the Middle East and then the American homeland. Um, I know you've written about this in your recent book. Uh, Cold War had its ebbs and flows in terms of the balance between the U.S. and Soviet Union. What do we need to do to uh, uh, put the Russians back on their heels, or as uh, I like to say, uh, uh, you know, kick some Russian uh, jopa or ass? Over to you, sir. <laughs> well, the first thing I'd like to do is figure out how to how to uh, sort of deal with uh, the fact that our president has a really weird relationship with uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, that that is inexplicable to me, but that's another issue. Um, I think that uh, actually part of the problem we face, particularly from a military standpoint, is where the Russians have been militarily aggressive. They have all the strategic advantages, whether it was in Georgia in 2008, uh, in Crimea in 2014, uh, Eastern Ukraine in 2014. Frankly, there was just no way we militarily could have challenged what the Russians were doing in those places. Now, we we sent ships into the Black Sea in 2008 to support Georgia. We, we sent in a lot of uh, humanitarian supplies. We made it pretty clear to the Russians that uh, they shouldn't advance any uh, further than they, any farther than they already had. Uh, I think we could have been more aggressive earlier on in providing um, um, uh, military assistance to uh, the Ukrainians, uh, defensive systems lethal systems that they that they could have used but again you have to bear in mind the russians were all the russians had escalation control they could decide just how much they were going to put in there i think that uh, one of the things that one of the good things that's happened in recent years is the forward deployment of us forces into poland and the involvement of nato allies in the baltic states and the air defense uh, patrols that are being flown out of the baltic states by a variety of nato allies i think this puts the russians on notice this is these are different uh, than ukraine or or georgia uh, and i think i think um, putin will be very careful in that in that arena i think i think his next move is probably belarus uh, and we'll see what happens there but I think I think we have failed. We have acted. The Congress has acted pretty aggressively in the recent years in terms of sanctions against Russia, against the measures that can be the non-military measures that can be taken uh, to put the Russians on notice that there are costs involved with what they have done. I think where we have, uh, and what I write about, is I think we have uh, failed to use our own cyber capabilities uh, to to get into their social media networks the way they have gotten into ours, in effect, to give them a taste of their own medicine. You know, when Navalny can be as successful as he was with his limited resources in exposing corruption by Medvedev and, and uh, Putin and so on uh, inside Russia, our, we, we need to find a way to get inside those networks and let the Russian people know how corrupt their leadership is and the behaviors that that are going on there and i would expand that to china and let the chinese people know about what what's happening to a million uyghurs and and so on and so forth so i think i think we have uh, in terms of russian aggression we have responded in the places where we could uh, we might have done more earlier in places like ukraine uh, but I also think that there, there are arenas in which we can push back against the Russians and give them a taste of their own medicine where we have not done so, I think, not because we lack the technology, but because we don't have a policy to do that. Mike, if I, if I could add to that, uh, we, got, we got to treat Russia as an adversary. <laughs> they are an adversary. Uh, and, and they've got to be treated that way. And frankly, you know, the only way you deal with Putin is from a position of strength. And the United States has conveyed weakness uh, to, to Putin. Uh, and so Putin's taken advantage of it, and he'll continue to take advantage of it if he thinks we're weak in terms of dealing with it. Uh, and I also have to tell you, I mean, the most damaging, the most damaging thing I think that was done uh, to our position on Russia was to have the president of the United States standing next to Vladimir Putin and basically saying that he believed 
Russian intelligence uh, above the United States intelligence, which conveyed a clear message to the world that uh, that the United States was not going to be strong when it came to dealing with Russia. So, you know, it's really important that that both the president as well as the country has to draw clear lines with regards to uh, Russia that make clear that uh, there are areas we are not we're not going to allow them to uh, to be able to take advantage of. That's the only way you deal with Putin is from a position of strength. And Putin, frankly, understands a, a position of strength. But if he sees weakness in what the United States is doing, and I think he's read weakness in, in the last number of years in terms of the United States, then he will take advantage of it. And that's what he's been doing. And that has to stop. Well, on that note, we'll conclude. All I can say is sign me up. I, uh, <laughs> that sounds uh, like great advice. Secretary Gates, Secretary Panetta, Admiral McRaven, and General Petraeus, thanks so much for an extraordinary and engaging conversation. I promise to get you out by 7.30. want to keep my word. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mike. Thank, Thank you. Great to be with you. Charles, over to you. Well, I'd like to thank Secretary Gates, Secretary Panetta, Admiral McRaven, and General Petraeus for sharing their time and wisdom with us tonight and for their selfless service to our nation. And I, I know Secretary Gates appreciates the fact that this event started and ended on the same day. I imagine he's probably still catching up on his sleep from the 2012 Donovan Award Dinner. I'd also like to thank all our sponsors for their generous support of the Oso oh Social Conversation Series. And we're very grateful to Dr. Vickers for his hard work that made this discussion series so compelling and timely. To learn more about the OSS Society, please visit our website, ossociety.org, where you can download a membership application. When you join, you'll receive an OSS Society membership card, a precise replica of General Donovan's OSS ID card, as you can see on your screen. An OSS staffer said General Donovan's imagination was so powerful, he could see an acorn and envision an oak tree. The OSS Society is planning to tell the story of how OSS became the modern day intelligence and special operations communities by building the National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations. The overhead rendering you see on your screen is what you will see flying into Dulles Airport. It will honor Americans who've served as our nation's first line of defense at the tip of the spear since World War II. And I wanna send a special thank you to all our panelists for serving as the honorary chairs of the museum's capital campaign committee. To close the series, we'd like to share with you an award-winning short documentary about D-Day produced by the OSS Society to commemorate last year's 75th anniversary of the Normandy invasion. And I'd like to thank Secretary Panetta for contributing a powerful introduction to our film. And I'd also like to thank the film's writer and director, Carl Colby, for his, uh, for his beautiful film that he made. Now, before we start the film, I'd like to thank you again for your support and generous commitment of your time throughout this series. We look forward to bringing you uh, this series again and seeing you at next year's William J. Donovan Award Dinner. Thank you very much.